Hello and welcome to the Be Glad movement. My name's Pollyanna and I'm on a mission to bring you as many stories as possible of good coming out of bad and reasons to be glad. And today I'm lucky enough to have been invited over to Irene's house. Hello. Hi Irene. Thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to speak to you because you've got a really interesting story. Um, Irene, well, I'll let you jump in and, and tell me because it all started when you, your, your parents split up, didn't it? Yeah, um, the, the very early childhood was really happy. My dad was a merchant navy in the merchant navy. He did used to go away to sea, but it was great when he came back because he always brought us with presents and things like that. And, and we had a really, really lovely family life in the early days. We lived in a nice house, we had five bedrooms, and life was good. My mum worked, my dad worked, you know, and, and in those days, you know, uh, it was rare for two parents to both be working. And so we had a really, really good life. And my dad was kind of like climbing up the ladder. He wanted to be, he was a navigation officer and he wanted to be a captain. Um, so he was studying his exams and stuff that he needed to do to get there. And I think the pressure of all that work and being away at sea and being away from the, such a young family mm-hmm. um, and being away at sea kind of turned to, to, to drink and he started to drink more and more heavily. It got worse as the years went by and then the more he drank, he started to become violent towards my mum um, and like she suffered like lots of beatings and things like that and in the end she got to the point where she was like I can't take this anymore she feared for our safety as well so she basically packed us one night he'd come home and he'd, and he'd beat her up anyway and next week she just grabbed all our stuff and we fled the house um, and we I think we stayed I think we stayed with um, a member of the family for that initial night uh, but then we went squatting in um, in empty houses, basically. So we were technically homeless, you know. We were three kids. Uh, there was three of us. So um, so yes, yeah, and we one couldn't get a tenancy because, you know, the, um, she although she was working, she didn't have enough money to be able to buy her own house, mm-hmm. um, and there was no tenancies available at the time. So we basically squatted for I think it was a few months, okay. and so we were living kind of you know there was no electricity obviously. Um, so we were just living like hand by candlelight at night time and, you know, food that my family would, extended family would bring or, you know, yeah. chippy dinners. How old were you then? Um, I was about, I think I was about eight, seven or eight, seven or eight I think. Um, yeah, I was about seven or eight. So I was still in primary school, we were all still in primary school. And then, um, like, the house ended up getting repossessed because my dad just, Stop paying the mortgage and just basically drunk himself away and then just disappeared off then right. um and so um after we squatted for a while we all managed to get a tenancy on the new build estate in toxteth um it was a brand new estate brand new council estate um but it was not <laughs> the houses were very poor quality really poor quality and right. it was like rats in the rafters and you know it was just awful and the walls were like paper thin you could hear everything so but anyway it was home it was a house so we moved in um and that's where we lived for, I think, seven years. We lived there for seven years. Now, Toxteth was an area which had lots and lots of problems of deprivation, social deprivation, social isolation. And mm-hmm. um, it was a predominantly black area where um, a lot of black people lived. And it was, it was poor, basically. It was, right. it was a really poor area. And then there was like tensions with the police. Police used to come into the estates and used to like kind of racially abuse people. I was on the mm. receiving end of that, me and my friends. Um, and we were only kids, we were just kids yeah. hanging around the streets, and it's not something you'd expect that you mm. think, you know, the police, police are there to protect you. Yeah. Um, and it's not what you'd expect. So, yeah, that was a little bit scary, really. And, and I really had a very, very, very low opinion of the police, I hate the police at that time. Sure. And then there was a story of people being taken in the back of the van. So it culminated in um, Tuxedo Riots in 1981, summer of 1981, basically there was a massive uprising and um, there was riots and the police were, like, came in in the hordes and then the riders came in the hordes and there was petrol bombs being thrown and it was really, really scary, really scary time because <clears throat> you just don't expect something like that to happen. It's quite surreal when you see like, you know, marauds of gangs. I mean, half the people who were involved in the riots didn't live on our estates. Wow. We knew everyone who lived in our estates, 
But I know a lot of people travel from different places because they just want to have a fight with the police and it was like, oh, it's a riot going on, let's join in. Right. Um, so, you know, some of it got kind of like overtaken by people from outside, but the, the reason for the start of the first mix was treatment and then, you know, the police and, and all the deprivation in terms of the housing quality and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that happened and of course my mum was like oh, terrified that we'd get caught up in that and then, um, so, you know, she wants to leave the estate, she wants to move. And it wasn't, I think it was the year after that we did end, end up moving. Um, she managed to save up enough money to be able to get a mortgage. And then, you know, she had, she was working two jobs. And we moved back to, not a couple of roads down from where we originally lived in Wavertree, back to Wavertree. Right. Um, so we lived there. I moved into the house, I, I think I was 16 at that time. And that's where we continued to live until I left home as, as an adult. But, um... One thing that my mum always instilled in us was about, you know, sort of educate your way out of, make sure that you're independent, educate your way out of poverty, mm. get yourself a good education, get yourself a good job and become independent because, you know, when she, she was dependent on dad, obviously he was the main breadwinner, even though she had her own job, right. but once seed kind of like, you know, fell off the wagon, if you like, um, she found herself help, um, homeless with three children which is not a very nice position to be in it must have been awful for her and I was like that will never happen to me I have one thing that will I will always be able to pay for the roof over my head so my mission was basically to leave school get a, well get a good education mm. um well I left school at 16 as we all did yeah and um, because we wanted to work we wanted to start bringing some money in to my mum first and foremost to help her out and also to have our own independence so I'm going to take these off because it's a bit distracted. I hate talking to people because someone else is on and I haven't got any on. Um, so, um, yeah, we just wanted to bring money in to, to, to help me want, and to be independent, financially independent because I was determined I would never rely on a map to sure. <laughs> put a roof over my head. Um, and I promised myself that I would continue with my education because when I left school, um, I was like, I was very academically bright and the teachers were like, you're just wasting your life, you need to go to university, you can go to university. And I'm like, I can't afford to go to university, you know, that means I've got to not work and not have any money for another however many years yeah. and then my poor mother's going to have to support me through that and I thought, I don't want to do that. I, I would have wanted to go to university but I didn't want her to have to sure. pay for, um, carry on paying for me. So I thought, well, I'll go to university when I can afford it and, you know, I'll get a job and then I'll do university later uh -huh. kind of thing. So, so I did, so I started working for the council. And I was just a clerk to begin with. I was just like pushing paper and acting clerk. But I don't care. It was a job, yeah. and um, and it gave me some financial independence. And then I worked my way up. I sort of went to night school and I went to day release and I did some qualifications in public administration. And then I got interested in law and I started doing um, the Institute of Legal Executives, which is a law qualification. Because yeah. I got into the solicitors department then, and I was a legal assistant. And I used to work firstly with investigating claims against the council, you know, some people who have chipping out accidents or accidents in schools. Right. We'd investigate on behalf of the council and then um, and if there was a claim needs to be settled then we'd deal with the, the, the claim. Then eventually I got into child protection which I absolutely loved, absolutely loved. Um and I was an assistant to the solicitor who basically did the child care proceedings if a child was in danger or you know, was being neglected or being abused, and then we take the children into care. Yeah. But we do the legal side of it, and we the the social service. And I absolutely love that area of work, just protecting the children. And mm. um, it was just like fascinated me. And it was through doing that that I met these two detectives, because obviously the police have the criminal investigation, and then we have the civil side of things. Right. Um, and I kept that. I don't know whether the that, I don't think they were specialist child protection officers, but they must have been really good. A child protection because they seem to get all the cases and so all the cases we were dealing with we seem to cross paths quite a lot uh -huh. um and i got chatting to them and they were really really lovely down to where lovely people and i'm thinking oh, of course they can't all be back in the police you uh -huh. know my experiences are all horrible yeah but they can't all be back because these guys are like obviously dedicated to those are doing a great job and seem really nice so anyway we developed a kind of friendship and then um, one of them said to me, he said, you should join the police, we think you'd be a good detective. And I'm like, do you think I've got pins in my eyes? No chance. <laughs> um, 
And I was like, no, it's not a career for me. And they were like, why not? Why not? And I was like, oh, because, you know, you know, because you're racist, you know. And it's, it's like, well, there may be some in there, but we're not all like that. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So I ummed and awed about it, and, like, and they kept on at me and on at me. And then the next one, the time I saw them, they just presented me with the application form. Come on, fill it in. We'll take it in for you. Just fill it in, and we'll take it off. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. So I thought, you know what? I've got nothing to lose. Let me give it a go. And you can't really change anything from an outside. You can, you've got to see what an organisation is like from the inside if you want to make changes, if you sure. think it needs changes. So I thought, well, I'll give it a go because I've got my law qualifications. I didn't think I was, I'd get through the recruitment process, to be honest. No. Um, but I thought, go on then, I'll give it a go. So I filled the application form in, sent it off. And then I got called for um, an entrance exam. Um, I flew the entrance exam, I got top marks in the entrance exam, and I was like, oh, that's <laughs> so uh, and then it was the medical and the physical and I flew those because I've was always i always been very active and very um, sort of sporty mm. um, and then what was after that? Oh the interviews and um, the other series of interviews and that came to the interviews and I was just like because I didn't think I'd get in I was really relaxed and like you know because normally with interviews I am terribly nervous and I just I can't get me yeah. voice across and I'm just like, oh. uh, but because I, I wasn't bothered and I was like thinking I'm not going to get it anyway so I was just really laid back you know to, on point but just really relaxed so yeah. the nerves didn't come across at all it probably worked in your favour it didn't did it? because yeah. I, and next minute I got an offer mm. I was like, oh my God. and then I was in a dilemma do I leave the job and the career that I've, I kind of pursuing yeah. to start something completely new because at the time I was a second line supervisor right. so I would have had to go back down to you know, being on the bottom again, sure. oh. and then the police, and then the uniform. Yeah, joining oh. joining an uh, organisation which you've only ever had bad experiences, bad experiences of, of yeah. other than those two guys that you're working with at the exactly. Council. So it was kind of like, oh, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? So I thought, do you know what? Give it a go because you can always, I can always leave that go back to me qualifications, and you don't always get a job back in the council. But you've got years of experience, so at that time it was very easy to kind of go out and again so I thought well I'm not losing anything am I and it was more money as well so I was like well, I'll give it then. Yeah, <laughs> so I joined um, and I suppose for me joining because I expected um, the racism I expected the sexism it didn't shock me when I found it yeah. I know colleagues of mine who've always wanted to be in the police and all oh, it's been their career since they were in you know, year dot Mm. And then they join, and then they see that it's not as professional as they thought it was, and then they get really, really disillusioned yeah. by things because it was just like I wasn't expecting to be like that. You'd expect the police upholders of the law; they're mm. going to be up here in terms of like equality, fairness, yeah. right up here, and it's not like that at all. But I didn't expect that, mm. so for me, it wasn't such a shock. And it was like, well, yeah, this is what I expected. But what are we going to do about it? Are we going to just right. let it carry on like this, or or what have you? So for the first few years, I just wanted to get on with the job. I just wanted to settle in, get on with the job. I had a great section. I was the only woman on the section. I was the only black person for miles around in the area where I was placed, as well as within the, oh, okay. among my colleagues. I think there was one other black guy in our subdivision, and he was based in Kirby. So, so you're looking at probably about 180 officers all together across three stations in that subdivision, and there was me and there was him as the only black people and he actually came to the station to, to introduce himself to me when when I joined and just to say like if you, if you need any help you need any support with anything whatsoever you can call me and I thought oh god how lovely was that's that? good really yeah. lovely um in fact he started the um the black police association which was a support network for black staff okay. he was the one that started that and that's how he was the perfect person for the job uh -huh. so um so that kind of reassured me, but I had a really, really good section. And although like, it was like, oh, go on, woman, make the tea, or, or anything to do with kids, you deal with that. And you got all that, all that sexist kind of stuff going on. Right. I did have a really great section, um, and I made some really, really close friends that I'm still friends with today from those very early days. Mm. So on the whole, it was good, but I had the, you know, the, the racist joke that the training sergeant told and didn't realise that I was, I'd walked into the room. Yeah. Um, and that was like, you're supposed to teach me how to do this job and you're telling a joke like that. And the, the other people, they weren't, they, the guys weren't on my section of the guys that were around there because I think we'd had an overlap and there was, a, there was other people there that weren't right. on my team. 
but they sat and they listened and didn't bat an eyelid as if to say you shouldn't be doing that or you know mm, uh, right. and it was like what have I walked into here? I don't mm. know what was his ear are we in yeah. sort of thing. So and with the sergeant to be fair to him, he actually took me to one side and he was like, Oh my gosh, he said yeah, you know, you should never have heard that. And I said, It's not a case of I should never have heard that. You should never have told that joke. Mm. Whether I was here, whether I wasn't, whether you knew or whether you didn't, that was totally out of order. And he, he said, he said, you know, I was, I was completely out of order. And he said, and you were well within your rights to make a complaint. And he said, and I'll support, yeah, and I'll you know, tell you how, you how you go about doing it and stuff like that. He said, you know, if that's what you feel you want to do. Mm. And I said, well, on this occasion, I said, I won't make a complaint. I said, but I'll tell you now, if I ever hear anything like that out of your mouth again, I'll have your job off you. Never mind, mm. make a complaint. And he's like, well, <sighs> because I wasn't wet behind the ears. I hadn't come out of university and not had any life experience. I've lived. Yeah. I've lived and I've lived in quite a rough area. Yeah. I've had some quite, you know, daunting experiences. And I was a second line manager. I was just supervising people and managing mm. and guiding people. So I wasn't like kind of wet behind the ears. Mm. And I was like, I'm not taking that from you. Yeah. You know, it's just whatever. So anyway, so that went by the by. And, and he was grace after that. I have to say he was grace after that. And then kind of like I got back into child protection, which I absolutely loved. I was one of the founder members of um, specialist child protection units, which I absolutely adored. It was the most rewarding, but the most stressful part of your time because, you, you know, you, you're interviewing kids about really, oh, really upset and horrible things that they've experienced at the hands of the family because it was all... Our, what we dealt with was interfamilial abuse so we didn't oh, deal with stranger abuse it was all interfamilial and when we started like the 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 referrals that we got like i think in the first year we got about maybe 40 odd referrals 40 different cases oh. by the time the second year came around it was up into 300 cases we got that year and then the next year it was like 450 cases because when people knew that there was a specialist unit and specialist people that could investigate this so they got that expertise and I believe we were still only here with the tip of the iceberg. We were the only here with the tip of the iceberg. So I did that for um, three and a half years. But then I, in the meantime, I was doing so. Sort of, I got promoted. I went back to uniform. Um, did a stint in uniform. Went back to child protection as a sergeant. So I was managing the investigators. And then I was do, did my inspector's exams. Because I was quite, <laughs> quite ambitious. I want to get up there. Yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. So um, I did my inspector's exams. And then... Um, I had an incident of being bullied by two inspectors. Oh. Um, over here on the widow, actually. Um, yeah. One who I was working with on neighbourhood, yeah. but I'd been seconded to the child protection unit uh, because of the background I had, because the sergeant had gone either on a project or gone long term, so they can be needed someone who knew what they were doing to just be able to. Right. go into the shoes and, and just do the work mm. without having to be trained and because I'd, I'd, I'd had all my training and all the experience and just put me in there so I was like yeah that's fine but there was i done my exam and I passed the I found out I passed the exam so I was eligible for the next promotion process um, and before the process came out these two got their heads together and I won't put it uh, go into too much detail but anyway they came up with some spurious allegations about um, me not informing them about leave I was I was taking um, I can't even remember half the stuff, but there's a, load, a list of things that they said I'd done, right. none of which I'd done, mm. and all of which I could refuse, because yeah. I keep records of everything, and I always have kept records of everything, mm. um, you know, records of when I, when I put my leave slip in, I keep copies of the leave slip, so I know that I have requested that leave, there's the copy of the leave slip, it's dated, yeah. you know, it was like four weeks in advance, and they were like, so yeah. everything I could refuse, but it went to our professional standards department for them to investigate, which is fine. And, and basically it was all found to be unfounded, but what it did do, because I was under investigation at the time, I couldn't go through the process, because you, you can't go through the process if you're under investigation. Um, so they managed to, they hampered uh, my going through the process the first mm. time round, and I was absolutely fuming because mm, of that. And I was like, but well, anyway, I was thinking, do you know what? I'll get, because what has happened is, both of them, separately, when I was working for one, he'd basically come on to me and wanted me to go drinks with him and wanted me oh, and he was married okay. and I'm just like no and I'd gone through a, a, a really bad breakup so I was feeling very vulnerable mm. and I think he thought you that know, was his oh, opportunity. That opportunity oh you know you can talk to me you know if you've got a problem let's go for a drink after work and I'm like mm. I said no no you're all right I've got friends and I can talk to my family and I'm fine and stuff no, I'm not thinking anything of it 
And then obviously that was his come on and I wasn't biting sort of thing. And then when I moved over to the fella, I mean he was a right philandra and he was having affairs left, right and centre. And it was well known. And he was like making all kinds of like innuendos and, and stuff like that, making all comments about, you know, my physique and stuff like that. And then he's come on to me as well and I'm just like Oh, you yeah. In now, you know, and I was just like, so I was just like slapped him down, I was like, I'm not interested, kind of thing. And I think that was that was the reason why they got the head mm. together and like and done me, done me legs. But I only missed one process because it was all bottom downs. And then um, I went for the next process and I passed first time now, which is very very unusual as well. And I only had twelve years servicing, and normally like. You say you can't even go for sergeants unless you went unless you've like got at least ten years service in because yeah. what you know kind of thing and it's like well it depends on all your experience and what you've done and, and the things you've been involved in and how ready you feel you were yeah. so I was thinking I'm more than ready I've got I've done loads not just in this job but also before the job as well so I went for it anyway passed uh -huh. excellent well done you yeah. and I went, yes yes <laughs> and so I had to. I had to send them an email to let them know. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you'd be really pleased to hear that. <laughs> uh, I don't think I could have resisted that. Now, uh, you yeah. kind of thing. And it has put something in it like, you know, um, you can't keep a good girl down or something. Uh -huh. And what goes around comes around and then um, have a happy life or something yeah. like that. <laughs> one of them. Took it to P complained to PSD or professional standards department, right. saying that he felt threatened and he felt, um, you know, that it was a, like a, a an aggressive kind of oh. physical threat, and he felt worried and scared for the safety. Really? <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh. So I was laughing myself so because I got a phone call from the um, superintendent of PSD, and he's like, I mean, I need to come speak to you. It's been a complaint. I was like, yeah, yeah, of course, can we came because I didn't know anything about it at the time. And he was like, did you write this email? <laughs> I just burst up laughing. And I was like, I said, yeah, I said, I wrote that email. So I sent it to him and I sent it to him. Mm. And I said, and the reason I sent it to him and to him, he said, I know, he said, I know about the background, I know about what they did, and mm. I know about, you know, the spurious complaint. And I said, yeah, I just thought you might like to know that, you know, yeah. that I got promoted. And I said, there was nothing sinister in it. It was just like, you know, it was a laugh and a joke. And because I'd worked with this superintendent in a previous role and he knew me, and he was like, I know, he said, I know this is not you, this is not your cadre, and you're not that type of person. Mm. He said, but you just need to be mindful that things might be misinterpreted. And I was like, That's, well, I hold my hands up, that it wasn't meant in that way whatsoever. I just wanted them to know that they hadn't won, basically, right. and yeah. got what, I, yeah, what they tried to stop me from getting. Yeah. So he was like, yeah, absolutely. He said, it's not going anyway. He said, I'm writing it off. He said, you know, so you don't need to worry about it, but uh, I just thought it would just give you a word of it. Friendly advice, and I was like, "Yeah, okay, boss." <laughs> so anyway, so that all went by the wayside, and then I ended up moving to Liverpool to work. And then I got a phone call. I was working in Nosley, that's right. I was loving it. Back doing twenty-four hour emergency, um, you know, calls, critical instant management. You know, you'd always in the heart of it, and I absolutely loved it. Loved working nights. I just turn up to jobs and go out and take jobs and stuff, yeah. supporting the staff, and I loved it, and, and I loved my staff. My staff were really hard workers and everything, and I just absolutely adored working there. And then, what well, came on juicy one set of nights, and then um, the sergeant came to me and said, Oh, believe you're leaving us. I'm like, Am I? No. Nah. He almost told me that. Oh, we've heard that you, um, the chief wants you to do this project. And I'm like, I said, Well, no one's spoken to me, so as far as I'm concerned, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. And then, of course, the next day I was up, next time I was on days, I had a, an email from uh, the secretary to the, or the PA, to the chief. The chief wants to see him. He's got a, uh, oh, there's a deputy, so he wants, he's got a job for you. He wants you to, to lead on this equality, new equality legislation that was coming in, so mm. we can get all our processes in place to assess what we do and our, assess our policies and processes. It was a massive project, and I'm like, I'm me. I'm flipping. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm happy. But the reason why was because I was the only person of colour of any rank. There was one other guy who's um, a Chinese guy who was a superintendent. Um, that was the only other um, guy that I knew, and he just kind of kept himself to himself. He, he wasn't involved in any like black peace association. Didn't he didn't get involved in anything like that. He just wanted to just be on his own, which yeah. was fine because mm -hmm. that's his choice. Um, but 
like all this, this the staff started looking to me because I was in a position of like I suppose authority. Yeah. Um because when you become a mom mm-hmm. as you do as an inspector then you've got a little bit of clout with the with the senior officer team and with the chiefs and like that. So anyway I went to meet the chief or the deputy and he was like, this is what we want you to do and we want you to because the guy remember I told you the guy in Kirby who'd came and said you have any problems I'll help you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He started the he started the Blackface Association. Unfortunately he died suddenly. Oh no. He was only fifty odd. Um and he got taken to hospital with something or something and he died and it was like and so the movement just disbanded because it was only him doing it. Sure. He was the one who basically was driving it and he was getting very little help really to be honest. Mm. Um anyway he died and the and the, the step said we want you to, to set up a new one. I'm like well it doesn't work that way because I've got to be voted in. You can't just say you're going to do it because right. it's down to the black staff who they want to lead on this. So he said, well, will you do the interim then? Will you be the interim chair? I said, I'm not going to be the interim chair. So I'll be the deputy and I'll support somebody else who's, you know, the interim chair. Mm. And I was like, no, we want you to be the interim chair. Mm. So I said, okay, I'll be the interim chair then, but I'm going to, like, sort of um, support somebody else to take over the role. Because yeah. I, I, I had my career planned in my mind. And, and although... I did join to because I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to get my career. I wanted to have a career first, yeah. you know. So anyway, as it turned out, like I did, I re got the movement going. I got it rebranded. I got a whole host of people involved. I formed an executive committee. I got like um, champions in each of the areas. You know, I got training for them. You know, training in reasons first contact, mentoring. You know, and I put everything in place, and then we held the elections, and lo and behold, I got elected. <laughs> so I became the chair, then the, the, the proper chair. So I thought, okay, well, I'll lead it for a couple of couple of years, mm. and then I'm going to like sort of mentor somebody else into the role, which is what what I did. But because I had, I had to. I suppose I had to do it really, but because I because I had like the um, the rank. Mm. The chief officers would listen to me, and if I wanted a meeting with them, I got a meeting with them. Right. And if I had an issue about something. I could take it to them. I could say, phone secretary, I need to meet with the, you know, the chief. I want to talk about this issue. I want to talk about that issue. We had regular meetings with them because we'd have committee meetings every three months. Right. And the chief officers would come to the committee meetings. And, and, and they, it was it was really vibrant and they were really interested in helping and support. I'm not sure the other guy got that same support because he was mm. a constable. And yeah. the police is very, very rank-oriented. It's rank snob. It's bank snobbery at all you've got the chain of command so you down there can't talk to me up here you've got to talk to him he talks to him he talks to him, he talks okay. to him and it goes up the chain of command and unless you're like kind of in the chain of command you don't have the right to really right. speak to anyone so i don't think you would have had the same you got the support to set it up but i don't think you'd have the same kind of ear of the chief officers and the senior mm-hmm. officers because if the police are comfortable, so how can he tell us what we, you know, kind of mm. thing? And there is that rank snobbery that goes on in the police, but because I did have rank, they did listen. So I managed to get like a budget, and I've got loads of facilities for it. And I thought, yeah, let's get it, uh, you know, good solid footing. And then became my, that, that was kind of the start of like my um, passion around how are we going to change this then? Because like, look at the situation, here I am. And I didn't even know I was the first black female inspector in the history of the of, the, of Merseyside Police. Mm. I didn't know that until I was approached by a historian who was doing a book on black pioneers, Liverpool born black pioneers. Right. Like, so the first head teacher, the first mayor, the first, you know, okay. footballer, the first. And so it was going back to like the 1800s up to the present day. Mm. And he was like, I want to fit you in the book. Because you're the first black female inspector in the history of Merseyside. Oh, why? Well, there's not been anyone else before, and he's like, no. I'm like, jeez, yeah. in this day and age, I'm like, you must be joking. This 21st century person, yeah. and it's like, oh god. So I was like, yeah, and he did. He featured me in the book. I have got a copy there. I'll show you later. Yeah. And I just thought, this, this is not right. This has got to change. I mean, there's so much black talent out there. Why aren't we getting them into the police? Yeah. And I know the barriers because obviously I had a barrier yeah. growing up in my experiences, and the way the police police the black community the problems were still ongoing because you know you see you were six or eight times more likely to be stopped and searched if you're black mm. and people used to get really upset about that so it was like well how are we going to turn the community around to get them like interested in jobbing the police 
yeah. now we, we need to change how the police police that community as well yeah. so so it was like a kind of two-pronged attack and from the getting people interested in the community into the career of the police well because i was from that community and i'd grown up in that community and then i joined the police and i progressed as well mm. i was a role model really so they thought i thought well if i go out there and tell my story then I'm going to get more people interested, and that's exactly what happened. I'd go into like the, um, I'd get like the local communities to set up an event. Like we did one in the mosque, mm-hmm. and we did one um, in um, a community in uh, on Princes Road in Toxted, where like the black community have set that up and they go to it and they have events there. Yeah. And I went there and did, did an event. And I was like, that nice. This is me. I went in uniform. Like, this is me. Like, right? I grew up in Toxted. I lived on the that estate, and I did the thing. And, you know, I was here through top advice. I was racially abused by the police, but I didn't think much of the police at all. But you might be wondering why I'm standing here today, coming and talking to you and saying, we want you to join. Well, mm. if you want the police to be different, and if you want the police to police your community in a more, um, what's the word, more understanding and culture-sensitive way, yeah. then you've got to come and join us and educate these people that haven't got a clue to police our community. Sure. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. I'm helping them. To understand what how they need to please the community, but you've got to come and join us so that you can. I can't do it on my own. You've got to be able to disseminate that information. Mm. And it's like, and because they had never been, you know, they yeah. never been approached in that way, and they've never seen anybody like like me, yeah. you know, in the in, in the police role and the rank. It was like, and it kind of turned the tide a little bit. And so I developed and designed this program, this Phoenix Leadership Program, which is a positive initiative positive action initiative mm. to get people involved so what i'd say to is advice okay i will give you these skills train you in this like on this leadership program if you promise at the end of it that you're going to put an application form in and then i'll give you a mentor for a year to support you through the application process because one of the things that people who don't have family members in the police or don't know anyone in the police or don't have friends in the police which black community don't right. as a rule mm-hmm. um then they've no idea about what's expected from the recruitment process what sure. the recruitment process entails they don't know who to go to to ask those questions so i was providing that kind of network and support for those people that most people have because they've either got a dad in the job an uncle in the job a yeah. brother or sister in the job or you know a friend in the job or a friend's dad's in the job. There's a network yeah. there, an unspoken network, and they can go to people to say, oh, what's the recruitment process like and how do you do this? And, but sure. the black community haven't got that because they haven't got those people in the job right. to, to come to the world. This is how we do it. So for me, it was important to give them the tools because it's, it wasn't about them not being skilled enough. It was about them not going through the processes and not having that, um, like, advantage that people in the job have. So it was about Like the experience that you had, they must have had sim- similar experiences. Oh. I mean, why on earth would I want to join? But for you to put that point across, oh, well, if you want it changed, you need to change it, it on the changing. inside. You know? yeah. Absolutely, yeah, because you can't you can't judge something from the outside and expect it to change. You've got to get in there and make mm. the changes, you know. So anyway, so we ran the, the, the called it Phoenix because Phoenix like rising from the ashes, you know, sure. you know, and having a movement of like change within the police so we get more. It wasn't just about black people, it was about women, it was about LGBT community and like people with disabilities who could do kids and well, like people who may be dyslexic yeah. or maybe autistic, but they've got like skills that the police can use and that you know, and they're good assets for the police. Yeah. So it wasn't about low room standards in any way, shape or form, it was about just broadening the talent pool. So so I brought these people in. I ran it for um, three years. Two years or three years. We I think we ran I ran three programmes and there was a fourth programme one when I was the country that was out. Um, and it was really super, super, super successful because all the people that came on the programme did that either join as specials mm. um, or PCSOs. And then when we had recruitment drives for the police, because we don't recruit the police all, all year round, yeah. you know, some of them joined as police. And we had managed to increase the diversity. Through that program, we got our first Polish police officer. We got our first female Muslim um, special constable. We had no female Muslim officers in the force at all. Right. Um, there was a guy who was dyslexic, and basically he was a special, but he was like, "Yeah, I couldn't do the because I'm dyslexic and I can't do this." Oh, of course you can. Of course mm-hmm. you can because you've got to put reasonable adjustments in place. He's now 
on the fast track program. He's going to be an inspector next year. Right. And he was like, I can't join the, the regulars. And he joined the regulars. And he was doing that good a job that he put him on the fast track program to get through the ranks and to, and to inspect 11 in three years. And I'm like, just goes to show you, all you need is somebody to tell you and to show you what your skills to you believe have in you. and believe in yeah. you. Because it's a confidence thing. It's always a confidence thing. It's, cause it's, not, it's not a lack of skills. It's a lack of confidence. Well, I don't see anyone who looks like me in, in that job. And mm. well, I can't. How can I do that? And there's nobody who looks like me or comes from where I come from has ever joined or progressed or you know been in that job. And it was just mm. about changing those perceptions. So I absolutely love that program. And it was picked up by other force because I was asked to go to the College of Policing to do a seminar talk about the success of the program and, and what we did and how we did it, sorts of things. And so I went and did um, a talk about it to all the other forces around the country and, and loads of forces took to you know, it because yeah. we were like, this is it. In, in their own, like, you know, the kind of snip, pinched bits and did bits. Sure. And, but the programme itself, they took on board and it was like um, used by a number of forces across around the country. And then out of that, I got headhunted to join the College of Policing um, as a consultant, basically working with 21 forces working on their positive action initiatives and how they can do it better to increase recruitment of minority groups because it was all about um, BME, black and minority ethnic groups, recruitment, progression and retention because sometimes we'll get black people into, into the police but then they leave because of the way they're treated and their experiences right. so we're not retaining the talent and then if we do retain the talent they're all staying at the bottom of the, you know, the bottom ladder and they're not making it up the ranks. Mm. So. This programme was about targeting and addressing the recruitment, retention and progression of black people. So I basically go in and um, look at the plans, what the positive action initiatives they had, you know, big suggestions about how they could do it better and, and stuff like that, and identify best practice and disseminate it around other forces and stuff like that. Mm. And, and that's what I did for 18 months before I was due to retire. <laughs> Right. and go my own way mm -hmm. but for me the great thing was making that difference absolutely tips as well i was at the college and um, we brought together two unconscious bias um, conferences just to highlight the initiatives mm -hmm. yeah overt racism does go on it's probably more covert than overt now because people know that if they are caught making a racist comment in this day and age now mm -hmm. they're going to lose the job yeah but that doesn't mean to say it doesn't go underground and people can be treated So that it still goes on, and then the unconscious bias side of things, side of things is when you've got a recruitment panel, say an interview panel that are all white, mm. and then you've got a black person coming in, or they're all male and you've got a female coming in. It's like, well, we know from research that people feel comfortable that people look like them, they sure. reflect them, and people recruit like people, people who are like them. Yeah. So. So if you've got all white panels, then they're going to recruit white people. It yeah. stands to reason. Research is out there. The psychologist, the psychology behind it, it's all there. Mm. So then, well, how, you're not going to make any differences if you're doing that. Then you've got to change the make of the panel and make it like more diverse. Put more females on there, more people from LGBT, more black people. On there, make it more diverse because then you're seeing people in a different light. So there was those like simple like, things that you, you could do, um, but it was just about like those things. So I did a master's degree just before I left that's right. So I did a master's degree which the police supported me to do. Basically they ran the um, program um, master's degree to get in police leadership. So I studied all about police leadership, ethics, culture, values, all those things. And I thought right my dissertation is going to be around the individual values of police officers because it's the individual values that dictate your behaviour in the workplace, that dictate your discriminatory behaviour, your prejudicial behaviour. Mm -hmm. It all comes from your values, and your values are hands down through generations. So, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's the blueprint of your being. Mm -hmm. So I thought if I do an, an, an assessment of people's value, value systems and see if that is um, supportive or not of equality, diversity, equality and diversity, so I geared it around that. And then I did a study of culture as well, incorporated culture because values dictate culture. Um, and then the impact of leadership 
and how leadership can make a difference or not yeah. to um, that discrimination and that bias. And um, so I did that for my dissertation and actually got a distinction for that piece of work. And then I subsequently wrote an academic paper for an international journal of emergency services and it got published in that. Um, and it's now been published in a book. <laughs> so Fantastic. it's like, yay, yeah. it means something. You've made a but, difference. But it's, it's, it's kind of because nobody, like nobody's interested. People are interested in it. But you've got to look at the deeper levels, not just look at the surface going and say, oh, we're not, we're not these, just we're not sexist, we're not this. Well, yeah, there are pockets of racism, sexism, and every, every other reason, because otherwise there wouldn't be the discriminatory, the, the, otherwise your police force would reflect your community and it doesn't. Right. So there's got to be things that have operation. And it was looking at the deeper levels, but I studied a little bit about unconscious bias as well when I, when I did the, um, pulled up those two conferences together and we had this guy come in, mm-hmm. this uh, professor, um, and he did a um an implicity test which is an unconscious bias test done on computer mm. but he wanted to test the delegates he's, he's done testing like countrywide of ordinary members of the public people in different like fields of work right. police people non-police people and he wanted to do this delegate who were all hr professionals and senior officers so we asked them i mean it was voluntary didn't have to do it so we asked them if they do the test and and i think something like 80 percent of them agreed to do the test um, and then he analysed the results and then presented them at the conference <laughs> and the, the, the shocking but not surprising thing was was that that group of professionals were more biased towards black and Asians than the police in general and than the population as a whole so I'm like there's a blockage mm. there, but how can you have people who are responsible for recruitment mm. who are more biased than the actual organisation that they work for and then the actual general public. Yeah. Well, how is that happening? How, where's that coming from? Mm. So that was like a massive, massive shock. Um, and the college like were kind of like, oh, we don't want to publish this because you know, it was just something for the conference and stuff like mm. that. And I'm like, that. Yeah. Mm. So it's in my book. <laughs> and it's in my research. Because the guy who did, who did it, it's his, it's his piece of research and he gave me permission to publish it. He was like, that absolutely. He said, this is what I need to get out there because people don't realise how this unconscious bias is actually impacting in all walks of life. Yeah. And it's like, you're absolutely right. So anyway, so it's gone out there and it's out and it's being spread, the word being spread. So after I retired then, because um, I thought, well, one thing I was pleased about is I left it in a, left the police in a better position, better, better ethnic state. mix, yeah. better state than when mm. I joined. And that, to me, is is a legacy that I that I take away with me, and I'm really proud of, because uh, I think there was five inspectors, five black inspectors when I left. I mean, I I was the only inspector for ten, the only black inspector for about ten years. Wow. And now we've got five, and we've got a chief inspector, and we've got a superintendent. You know, so it's it's progressed now. So obviously, the, it's continuing. The work is continuing, which I'm really really pleased about. Um. So now I've gone like set up my own business because um, I love I, I did coaching like because I, I, I coached and mentored many of the Phoenix students and you know did interview coaching with them which was kind of like um, helping them identify the skill areas, the transferable skills, and how to present their evidence and stuff like that, mm. um, and building the confidence because it was all about confidence. And, and I remember one of the students saying to me because she she applied to join the special right, and I was mentor, I was her mentor and coach. I interview coach that she scored the top marks in the interview and the interview with the panel were absolutely blown away by her. She's amazing to be coach. Um, but anyway she got she got in and she came to me, she was like, You were born to do this. She came to see me to give me a thank you present or something, lots of chocolates and stuff and I'm like, Do you have to do that? I suppose I'm a dog, so I like and she's like that and she said, You were absolutely born to do this, she said, You are amazing and I'm like and it flicked a switch in my mind, thinking, mm. yeah, this is what I want to do, and this is what I need to do for people beyond the police, for people else in, in society as a whole. So mm. that was the, the reason why I thought, right, I'm gonna set up my I want to work for myself, and I want to be able to build people's confidence and, you know, coach people. So I did, that's what my business. Um, oh, I've lost my chain of thought then, I Yes, that's right, yeah. So I started going to networking events, like, you know, with business people, entrepreneurs, etc etc mm. and every event I went to I'd walk in the room 
and it was predominantly white men. Right. The heads of all these organisations. And the only one where there was predominantly women was a Liverpool Ladies Network. Because right. <laughs> it's a ladies network. Uh-huh. And I'm like, yes, women, women. <laughs> but even then, not even a handful of black women. Really? I'm like, where are the black women? Where are all the black women? I'm thinking, mm-hmm. this is just not right. So I'm seeing the same thing in private practice as I saw in the public sector. And right. I'm like, no, 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 no. So um, I went to, I was approached by a woman who works for the Institute of Directors. Have you ever heard of those? The Institute of Directors, yeah. basically mm-hmm. it's all the top people of top organisations or all organisations mm-hmm. and they basically, you know, decide on policy or, or influence policy and, and they do a whole load, host of things around entrepreneurship, support entrepreneurs. And she said, oh, you know, would you consider joining? I said, well, I don't know anything about you, but I'll have a look at on the website and see you a little bit, but I'd, I'd like to come to an event first and get a feel for it before I decide. So she said, oh, great, because we're having a, 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 a kind of like a, a, a canopies and kind of networking event in Liverpool in a couple of weeks. Why didn't you come to that? And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. So I went along to it. And I walked in the room and it was just like a sea of men, white men in suits. And I was like, and I felt really quite intimidated. I felt quite like, because I remember, I went back to that feeling that I used to have when I walk into a management meeting and right. I'm the only black face in the room and well, I'm not the only woman in the room and I was yeah. in the police. And I'm like, oh God, oh God, and you just took me right back there. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to be doing this again. Okay. So anyway, I met, met Claire, who's a lady that invited me. She was like, oh, I can't believe this. I said, what's wrong with this room? And she went, Again, it? Uh, looks like I'm on a mission again. So um, I spoke to the the chair of the um, of the Liverpool IOD, and refreshingly, he's um, a gay guy. And he's the deputy commissioner of the charity commission because this is all voluntary. This work is all, all voluntary. And I said to him, I said, I want to join the committee. I said because this needs to change. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, absolutely. He said, I'm with you on my side. It, it does absolutely need to change and said we need more people on board you can, you can actually make a difference mm. and I said okay so well I'm happy to join the committee and I'm happy to offer my services and then was like fantastic fantastic you sign you up and uh, so I'm now on the committee um, so it's very early days like I've only literally just uh, joined the committee mm. so I'm looking to do work with some of these organisations to get them to change what I call their snowy peaks and get more black people up there and get more women in these influential positions yeah. and it's doable it's absolutely doable but you've just got to put a bit of work into it because these things don't happen organically when you've got a predominantly white board at the top of the organization it won't happen organically it, you've got to put extra effort in to make sure that you recognize the talent of people who are different to them sure. people from other minority groups yeah. So I'm now on another crusade hmm? to make a difference in this world. Wow. How it's going to go, I don't know. But it's just wrong. It's got to be. It's yeah. got to change. The, the only events I go to where I see a sea of like black talent in the room is when I go to an equality and diversity event. There was one recently at the International Business Festival in Liverpool. Right. Um, and equality, diversity, and inclusion, and Commonwealth events. And the talent, there's so much talent in that room. Mm. And you're like, well, we know what you're talking about. We're, we're, the, we're the lived experiences of what you're talking about. Yeah. Where are all the white people coming to learn about this and seeing the talent in the room and seeing what is out there and seeing, you know, what people are capable of? And, and that's frustrating because you have any quality and diversity conference new people that tend to go to it are the black people right. or the people who are from those minority groups yeah. not the majority groups and that's where that needs to change you've got to get the people from the majority groups to come along to exactly. see see what they need to know and what they need to learn so yeah that's my mission yeah. that's my mission now because I don't want to keep walking into rooms and going to conferences and going to events and feeling isolated because I'm the only black woman in the room sure. Just all one of maybe two or three yeah. people in the room. It's just not right. It's just not right. It should be well different now because Britain is a much more multicultural society.
society we've got like you know i mean london's like 44 percent last census 44 percent are ethnic minorities not going to be minorities anymore they're going to be the majority soon sure. and lots of other places around the country have like big minority groups you know not just ethnic minorities obviously so that's, a, that's an impression because that's what i'm part of mm. so why aren't why aren't these people yeah. getting into and it's not because you know they're, they're not talented enough because like um I, I remember going to uh john moore's university for an, a policy conference and there was a guy who was talking about um the statistics of students graduates how black student graduates like have like a 50 percent less chance of getting a job than a white counterpart they might they'll have the same degree the same like you know levels or the same like you know first class or second or two one what have you yeah but they're twice as likely to be unemployed as someone who's white who's got the same qualification yeah. why is that it really surprises why me why is that it's like and even in the universities themselves the people who tend to be like the um the professors and the senior professors and the, they're all white men as well mm. it's like so how how can you like sort of advance equality when you're all white at the yeah. top of your organisation as well? And it's like you don't seem to see that there's anything wrong or that there's any problems or that there's any or if they do see that there's a problem or it's an issue. They don't have to do that. Oh we've got a policy, we've got a policy, diversity policy. Oh, the girl has put a policy sat on a shelf or on a computer somewhere. How is it lived? How is it breathed? How what do you do? Yeah. to make it real and to make what action do you do with it it's always having the policy sitting there but what do you do with it what action are you taking as a result of that policy mm. and more often than not it's, that's why like you don't see people um you don't see many people from minority groups in these senior positions in these organizations so for me like you know start getting people starting their own business and being entrepreneurs then they are heading for their own businesses aren't they? And, they can make a, and they can make a difference sure and then the others who are already in organizations trying to support them to get through the ranks or trying to support the organization to support them to go through the ranks because they don't need this there's, there's nothing wrong with them it's not that they've got no skills they've got no talent they've got no drive no determination mm. it's about the opportunities they've not getting the opportunities to to advance because of the it's the, the recruitment or the retention of the progression program process, process is weighted against them right. and the people who are making the choices are choosing people like them mm. so it's got a, it's really really got to change so that's my new mission my well, new you, mission you sound like the, the perfect person to be heading up you know with your police career and yeah well, not only like what happened to you in the past growing up in, in Tuxton and yeah. um and being there were sort of opportune moments weren't there you know getting um accepted into the police force yeah. but the fact that you were so sort of nonchalant about yeah. it and then you know you got in and yeah. so then you're in a position because you've been a, a driven person and with your mum telling you don't rely on a man yeah. you, you had that um drive so that background resulted in your mum giving you that message and um Absolutely, you yeah. being able to stand in front of all those potential new recruits and say look i have been there and done this yeah i know yeah. where you're coming from because i've lived through it too yeah come on guys we need to change this you know and so you were able to sort of your, yeah, yeah 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 totally and yeah. um and create that movement so everything that you've learned in the police force is going to totally be transferable isn't oh yes it? It, do you know it so is because i did i do most speech and I'm speaking as well mm. and i was at an event um called little x little growth expert and it's all bus people in business people entrepreneurs heads of businesses and it's all about learning how to make your business better how to make your business grow and stuff and i was like asked to come and speak at this event mm. basically just to share my story like i am with you um and at the end goodness gracious i was like absolutely inundated with people coming to me going that phoenix program we need to have that in our organization we need to be doing this with that this organization you know we need to be working with the kids as well to build up their confidence because they don't get this kind of input mm. in school in the you know the national curriculum and those like from minority groups do need that extra support to realize the potential and to build the confidence and stuff because they're not seeing role models anywhere sure. and i was like in the days of show coming to me i was like she's there is a need yeah, there's a need definitely. out there there's absolutely definitely need out there and i'm like i've made some contact with some of those people 
and we are going to do business together because there is an absolute need to make changes, make absolute changes. And I'm, I'm, mm. I'm looking at working with them in organisation who are looking at apprenticeships and how we can make apprenticeships more diverse and, and support young people. If you don't want to go to university, university isn't for everybody, no. not everybody's academic, but everybody's got a skill and everybody's got a talent. And it's how you get access and bring out that talent in people. Mm. University may be the way with some people, but it's not with all no. people. Yeah. Apprenticeships may be the way with some people. You know what I mean? And you've got to give that, that diversity approach to allow people to excel and for them to, to show their true talent and their, you know, their special gift and mm. use it in the workplace so they can earn money and, you know, and, and live. Yeah. That's what it's about is, you know, selling your skills so that you can have, you know, an income to live. Because everybody needs to live. Exactly. Everybody needs money to live. And, you know, people are being denied the opportunity to have, like, proper careers and proper, you know, sorts of um, roles because they happen to be born black or they happen to be a woman or mm-hmm. they happen to be, you know, lesbian or gay or they happen to be transgender or they happen to be whatever is different, you know. And what annoys me is, like, the population, men are the minority in the population, it's 52% women, or it's 51%, 49% mm. to men. So why are they in control? Why? And it's not that I'm anti-men. I'm not. Mm. Men are really, really talented and have an absolute role to play. So do women. Yeah. And it should be 50-50. It should reflect the community. Absolutely should reflect the community. So that's for me is like why I why we need, absolutely need, more women in these senior roles so that they can make the changes. Sure. And sure. I lead know, by example, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely. It's totally leading by example so yeah. that other people can see what's going on and that what actually it's it's fine for a woman to be in power. Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah totally, absolutely. Yeah. Instead of having that, like, you know, I know some people think, oh, no, they're going to go off and have kids and they're going to, oh, uh, I'll try not to swear. <laughs> yeah. You know, so what? What if the women do want to go off and have children? Why can't mm. the men? Stay home and look after the children. Yeah. Why can't you be a house husband? Why does it have to be the woman that stays home and looks mm-hmm. after the children? Mm-hmm. I mean, I adopted my son as a single parent, mm-hmm. and um, and gosh, the, the 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 way my workplace changed towards me when I became a parent because before I became a parent, yeah, I was available twenty four seven. I could you know come into work at the drop of a hat, and I often did. I never ever worked just be forty hours. Mm-hmm. I was always coming in early, going home late. I'd come in on the rest days. Because I was that passionate about the job yeah. and I was that passionate about my career as well. And then, of course, when you have a child, then you can't because mm. you've got a childcare situation and what have you. And the role I was in at the time was fine because it was mostly a daytime role. Yeah. It was I was working in the major incident team, so we dealt that with murder investigations. But it was we had four teams and if a murder came in, you know, this team would get it, then the next team would get it. And it'd only be like sort of the first couple Maybe the first week, two weeks of a murder where they'd be all hands to the public and you'd never need when you're going to get off and stuff like that. Mm. So it only happened very rarely. Maybe once in a year. And then the rest of the time you were like, you know, doing investigations. I'd work nights um, and I'd work weekends, uh, but you didn't have to like be working late. Kind of right. And the nights were pre planned, the weekends were pre planned, so you could put childcare in place. Mm. But if a job kicked off, then I couldn't just stay on duty because I'd have to go home, pick me some, try and make some arrangements. I could come back to duty once and make the arrangements. Mm. Um, or sometimes I might not be able to if I couldn't get this. But the difference, because my career there halted. It right. halted. Um, and at that time, in the, in the police, nobody who was on what they call a flexible working pattern. Now, my flexible working pattern, this is how stupid it was, like, my department or my team worked at four, um, once to Friday, and then weekend. My flexible working pattern was half eight to half four, and still doing weekends and still doing the nights. That was that was the only difference, um, and that was a flexible working pattern. And therefore, I couldn't progress within the organisation because nobody above inspector rank had a flexible working pattern. And it was like, oh. and laugh. it's a half hour difference. I went, but I did go part time. When I first came back for about three months, and I say part time, I dropped four hours, so it was less than an hour a day <laughs> that I dropped, and it was like, really, yeah. really, you know, was it that backwards? And it really was, it really was that backwards, and that's where my career altered. And I was just like, you know what, flipping heck, mm. sexism is still 
still so prevalent, still so prevalent, because there was a guy I was working, I was working not on my team, but there, and it's, I think his wife was taken ill or something like that, there was some issue, and he couldn't come in for eight o'clock every day, so, oh, no, no, don't worry about it, no, just come in when you can come in, you know, that's it, don't worry about it, yeah, we'll just work around you. Wow. He didn't have to go on a flexible working pattern, and it certainly didn't interview with his career, and I'm like, how's that? How's yeah. that fair? You know, that's because he's got like his wife's house of action, and so he's got childcare responsibilities. But that's okay. You just we'll just work around you. Yeah. But for me, it's like you've got to go on a flexible working pattern, and if you're on a flexible working pattern, the uns- it wasn't the written rule, it was the unspoken rule that because nobody in the force had above the rank of inspector had a flexible working pattern at that mm. time, and it was like, and I remember speaking to a superintendent, a chief superintendent. Because I had a massive issue with this, um, and and I went to speak. She was a woman, and she was a single parent, or she had been a single parent for a lot of her career. But she had to live in au pair, right. which I wasn't prepared to do because I didn't want any strangers living in my house sure. and who they are. And she had lots of problems with hers, and she had uh, several au pairs. And I thought that's not that's not what no. I that's not my choice to do. So and I went to her and I said, okay, so if I wanted to come out of the MIT and come and work like an area back an area where they do more late than you know than, than days and stuff like that but mm. I want to come with a flexible working pattern and she was like no, oh, no I wouldn't take you I was like why is that she said because well if you couldn't work late that means somebody else would have to wear your late and I said well no it doesn't actually work that way she said because I'd still be doing my role my complete role mm. and I'd still have my own quota of cake and um, of cases and stuff and I said and there would be occasions when I could absolutely work late yeah. I said so, you know, and I thought coming from you, mm. who's been a single parent, she said that's just the way. That's just the way I I think, and I'm thinking. So you're a woman. You've been a single parent, and you're a barrier now to other single women mm. and parents. You're not helping. You're a hindrance. Yeah. You know, because of course you did what I did it. Well, you did it because you chose to have a living au pair, which sure. you could afford first and foremost. How many people can afford that? Mm. And how many people would want that? As well, right. and I just thought that was your choice. I thought I, my choice is a different choice, and I just thought, you know what? It's like you are viewed as if you're part time or flexible workers that you're only part committed. And do you know, as part time workers, research has been done about this part time workers actually are more productive per hour than full time workers and work extra hours because they've got that guilt complex sure. of like, oh, I'm not pulling me weight. So they work extra hours and work and come home and do work at home yeah. because they don't want people to think that they're not pulling the weight. Yeah. So they're actually more productive than as is home workers are more productive than people who just sit at a desk and pretend to be working, pretend mm. to be doing stuff. So for me, it was like really frustrating that the woman that you've seen you like that who mm. can have yeah. those who who is, who is part of the problem, not part of the solution. She should be like right. You should be getting more women, and women should have the support. They can be flexible workers, and they can do this and they can do that. Because at the end of the day, you know, the role doesn't necessarily you don't have to be there. It's yeah. presenteeism. You know, if you want bums on seats, you don't have to be there. If there's mm. nothing going on, kind of thing. Sure. And it was just like really frustrating. So I just thought, oh, you know what? Yeah, this yeah. is obviously this organisation has got a very, very, very long way to go. We've made some inroads with the police here, here with my ethnic minorities, but we're still not there with with them. Um, it's just like so yeah. deeply ingrained into the psyche, oh, and it really. needs um, sort of creative thinking around yeah. these problems. It really, does. doesn't it? it needs yeah. people that are willing to. <laughs> it needs people that are willing to sort of stand up and come up with ideas, and because. Sometimes when you come up with ideas and they just get smacked down straight exactly. away, you've got to try off. things out. Yeah. You've got to try things out. Mm-hmm. You know, people have got to think outside the box and not. Oh, this is the way we've always done it. Well, the way you've always done it doesn't work no. because you're getting the same old, same old, same old. And if you mm-hmm. want to make it change, you've got to change the way you do it. Sure. And that, like for me, is is the message. And mm-hmm. and you know, for me, it's like I suppose my life has been a sort of an, you know, out of like very negative experiences has come some really positive drivers and positive like kind of um passions to make a difference and being able to make that difference because I've had that experience back here and there and there and there mm. I've been able to like tell myself and think right this has got to change and make a change for the positive and that for me is like yeah I wouldn't wish my experiences on anybody no. but it's made me the person that I am and it's made me the driven person that I am 
to really, really want to make a better world for, for those coming up behind me. Because certainly for my son, I don't want my son to have the same experience mm. that I've got. I want him to be able to walk into an organisation and them to see his talent and not see his skin colour. Yeah. That's what I want, to see his talent and see what he's capable of. Don't just see, oh, it's a black person, mm. what can you do? You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't want him being stopped and searched on the bloody street when he's just minding his own business, doing nothing. Yeah. I don't want that for him. Mm. So for me, by doing the things that I've done, is for me to try and make a difference so that he doesn't have to experience those the same things that we had when we were growing up. Mm. I don't want him to experience that, and he shouldn't have to experience no. it. Mm. So the next generation coming through, I mean, they are more diverse. They are more accepting. They are more open to mm. difference. It's us. Awesome. Have the dinosaurs that are still at the top of these organisations yeah. that need to either change or move on. Right. Move on and make room for the ones who have got the forward thinking and who are more accepting of diversity because that's the only way to change. We need to move. We need, we need more people like you. <laughs> and there are lots of people like me. Yeah. Well, no, there isn't because I'm unique. But no, <laughs> but no, we do need people who've got those jobs. And there are, mm. I know I've, like, I've met so many inspirational people so many talented inspirational people who are from minority groups who are like driven to try and make a difference and mm. to try and change things in their own sectors kind of thing and and so yeah there's, there's definitely a movement there's it's definitely true. a movement and people are making a difference in their own little areas mm. and soon it will join up together and it will be a massive force for change a massive movement and lobbying the government and making a massive force for change because the appetite's there and the drive is there and people are sick and tired of saying old, saying old. Yeah, it shouldn't be like that anymore. It shouldn't. It's so, it shouldn't. yeah, it's mental. You know, for 25 years in the police, I've been experiencing that. And now, in as a you know a business owner, I'm still seeing it. Mm. And I'm like, oh, please, no, this has just gone on for too long. What, 2018? Yeah. How diverse is our country? And this, this is still happening. Mm. So, yeah, for me, it's like, Gonna oh, end. Enough, it's, yeah. it's gonna finish. It's gonna finish in my oh. lifetime. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and for Are explaining you your story and uh, you know, it's really inspiring stuff and I oh, know that you're you. gonna be making all those changes. Oh, I am. It's fantastic. I am. It's really once fantastic. I get once I get a beamy bonus about something, I can't yeah. stop. I can't mm. stop. And I look at my son and I'm just like, No, you're gonna have and he is having a better life, he's having better experiences in school than I had. Oh no, saying that no, I tell a lie. My school experiences were phenomenal. That's why I loved school. I had, a, I had a great experience in school, primary and secondary, fantastic schools. Um, and and they were predominantly white areas as well. There was very there was only like a handful of black kids in either of the schools. Mm. Um, my the, the the abuse that I got was when I came out of the school oh. when I was standing at the bus stop waiting to get the bus home. diversity and, and celebrating other people's cultures and stuff and they actually asked me to come in and do a cultural workshop an art workshop oh, cool. so I did a um, uh, kind of exploring culture through art so it was like a, a Ghanaian art workshop because my dad's Ghanaian mm. and me and my sister went to Ghana and met our family over there yeah. um, and I brought back a load of stuff like Ghanaian clothes and jewellery and, and so I took it all into the school and basically we did an exploration of, of culture different cultures through art and all Do you know what? <laughs> I thought I thought he would be embarrassed because he gets terribly embarrassed about oh. kissing him or hugging oh. him in front of his friends. Don't do that, don't do that. Yeah. Well, and I thought he would be embarrassed, but you know, you, his face absolutely lit up and you could see the pride on his face. The teachers all took photographs and stuff and recorded it all. And his little face, it was just like, it was like, because all the kids loved it and all the kids were like, oh, this is brilliant, oh, this is really lovely, oh, this is. Yeah. And they were all like singing me praises. And he was like, Mm, that's my that's mom. my mom, like Yay. really proud and stuff and I thought, oh bless you. So yeah, they're already having better experiences and that's what 
that's what schools need to do. Yeah. Need to celebrate difference in the school and make it part of the curriculum, not an extracurricular activity, but everyday business because diversity and acceptance and respect is everyday business yeah. throughout life. Yeah. Education, work, socialisation, social, everything. It's it should be core business though. And until it is core business though, I'm not gonna stop. And businesses can get mentoring from your, your business mentors, other businesses on how to incorporate. Absolutely, them. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's part of the services that I offer. Mm. It's not about I do individual one to one coaching because that is important for me mm. to help individuals to realise the potential and build the confidence and find their talents and find their area of excellence because everybody has it. People don't bother to explore it within themselves and then you know, they go into roles and they feel unhappy and they feel unfulfilled and then they spend years in those roles and then the mental health will deteriorate and they get mm. people like depressed and sad because they're not fulfilling the potential yeah. and they know they're not doing what they're here to do. Right. So for me it's about helping them identify what that is and to go for that role that is their role or if there's no role out there that meets your particular skill set up your own Create business and do it yeah. 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 set up your own business and do it mm-hmm. you know you, you can do whatever you like but you've got to have the confidence to do yeah. it so the individual coaching is important but it's also about working with businesses about well how are you identifying your talent within your organization how are you supporting them what are your processes for recruitment why are we, how are they blocking you recruiting talent from minority groups and so it's working with businesses on a consultancy consultancy basis yeah. to support them in making changes in their processes so they can access that diverse talent pool mm. because another point of research has been done over and over and over again that more diverse organisations are more profitable so bottom yeah. line you're going to get more money mm-hmm. you're going to earn more money you're going to get more that. That. so yeah. it's worth it mm. not just for the moral case but for the business case as well and that's well documented and well out there Mm. And that's what people need to realise. So yeah, it's working with businesses and individuals to help them to make the changes. Mm. So yeah, and I've worked in schools as well. Working with kids, uh-huh. kids are so oh, the sponges and they they're so open minded mm. and they're so creative. And we kind of educate that out of them when they yeah. see the school and they've got to conform and they've got to behave yeah. and they've got to act this way. And we actually educate the individualism and the creativity mm. out of them and yeah. that I find really frustrating as well yeah. so yeah working in the schools and helping them to sort of like do things a little bit more creatively and a lot of schools do you know a lot of schools are getting onto it now because like you've got the independent school movement a lot of them are actually looking at alternative ways of education still doing the curriculum mm. but alternative ways of delivering it sure. which doesn't necessarily mean people sitting in yeah. classrooms like listening to the teacher being spoken at because most people or a lot of people don't learn in that kind of like instructional way they like to experience to feel to try to touch to do you know and have like sort of like experiential learning but they don't do experiential learning in schools Mm -hmm. and they need to kind of incorporate little bits of different types of learning you know people who learn in an auditory manner they learn visually but sometimes they can take it and people who learn by experiment there's all different ways of learning the school needs to incorporate different ways of learning to make sure that all the pupils are having a little taste of their own way or their preferred way of learning I know you can't do it all the time but you shouldn't take it yeah. so, yeah. I go on forever Polly oh, yes, so I'm going to stop <laughs> I was going to say you've given us so well the, the view is so much food for thought it's been a really rich conversation and I've really enjoyed talking to you well listening to you it's been brilliant <laughs> No, but yeah, thank you for the opportunity to, to do this because I think the movement that you're doing about, you know, looking at positive new stories, because, yeah, people do struggle. People do have, have adversity in their life and, you know, and people struggle, but it's what they do with that adversity. How do they turn that into adversity? And you finding people and putting it out there because there are so many great inspirational people out there, but we don't hear about them. This is not that much. When you be in the news, it's all about yeah, and I, I don't listen to the news to be honest because I just I can't bear to hear about you know this murder or that death of this maple. I don't want to hear about that because how's that going to make me feel better? How's that going to make me a better person? Mm-hmm. I want to hear good news and then that inspires you to want to be better and to want to do more. Yeah. So bringing that good news to people, I think, is the best thing you can do 
to raise people's self-esteem, raise people's well-being, and let people see that there's more good in the world than there is bad, yeah. and concentrate and focus on the good. So yeah. this, um, I'm just really pleased to have the opportunity to, yeah. to, you know, to hear about your movement, to be part of your movement, and listen to the stories of the other people that you've spoken to. So well, that's gonna. Yeah. That's going to spur me on to make a difference. I know that more. you're going to be inspiring a lot of people. Well, I hope so. Well. Definitely. I definitely. hope so, because that's what it's about, isn't it? Yeah. People being inspired and inspiring exactly. others. Exactly, exactly. So. And because we've been talking about multicultural voices, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll finish the video with all, what I always say is, you know, if you like this video, do um, click and subscribe and follow. But I, I want people to get in touch because your story might be very similar to another story that's been told, but your story and your voice I really do believe will talk to at least one person because they'll be able to relate to you for whatever reason it is you might not even understand it now but for whatever reason coming from you that's going you're going to be the person that speaks to them and helps them be a better person so if you like this video please do hit the subscribe button follow us on Instagram Twitter and Facebook and uh, yeah do get in touch if you've got a story to share because I would love to hear from you I'll catch you in another episode many thanks Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>